Hallelujah, Lord. Woo, we bless you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus, 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 Jesus. We worship you. We're here for one reason, to worship you, Lord. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus, we praise you. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus. It's a revival, Lord. Oh, 
hearts are waiting hearts for, Jesus. for Jesus. Father, let revival fire fall. Yes, Lord Jesus, let it fall, Lord. Let it fall, Lord. We love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I praise you, Jesus. Our glory is yours. Our glory is yours, Lord. Our glory is yours. Bless you, Lord. you Jesus oh I bless you Lord hallelujah Lord and the reason why we sing Jesus and the reason why we sing Lord we bless you we bless you
Jesus. What a friend I found More faithful than a brother I have felt your touch More intimate than lover What a hope I found, Jesus. You're more faithful than a mother's love. I don't know what I would do if I would ever lose you.
The Lord calls to the backslider tonight, come home. What you feel in this place tonight, if you don't know Jesus Christ, is the presence of God Almighty, the Creator. And He's calling to you tonight, but He's also calling to His church. He calls to me. Whom shall I send? And I answer Him. Bless you, Jesus. 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 We praise you, Jesus. Oh, God, we give you glory. We give you honor. Oh, holy, holy, holy are you, O oh Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, O oh Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord, holy. Oh, yes, you are. 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 You're the Lord. You are God. You are worthy God. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus.
pressures of life getting you down and you need peace of mind why don't you cast your cares on jesus for you know he cares for you is there anything too hard for him that he cannot do
believe the Lord's trustworthy? I'm going to ask a um, very special family here in our church if um, they'll come. I don't think his wife is here tonight, but Benny's here. Benny, uh, come on up. We just found out yesterday that Benny and his wife, of course, have been expecting a baby for about the last nine months. She's within three weeks of delivery. And this will be their seventh child? Eighth. Eighth child. And uh, they um, found out yesterday that there's no heartbeat and she's within three weeks of delivery. And Benny is such a faithful member of this church and such a godly man. And his wife, Hazel, sings in our worship team. She's not here this evening. She's, I think, going into labor. But from all appearances, unless God intervenes, it looks as though the baby is, is not alive. But we're holding out, believing God, that before the baby... We're holding out and believing God that before the baby is born and before she delivers the baby, that we're believing God for a miracle. Friend, let me tell you something. I believe with all my heart that this year the Lord is going to show forth his right arm of power. And I believe that uh, God is going to still bring in a great harvest of souls, but I believe he's also going to show forth his power, not only to save, but to deliver and to heal and to set free. And uh, we're going to pray for Benny. Hazel's at home, isn't she? I want you, if you will, please, I'd like to have as many of the uh, elders of the church as we have here tonight, as many of our deacons, if you will, come, please, and directors of the church and other staff members. We want to just gather around our brother and pray for he and Hazel that God will touch her body tonight and give them a miracle. I'd like for all of our deacons, if you will, just make your way to the platform right quick and also our directors as well as staff members. Come on to the platform, fellas. I know it's going to take you a little while to get here. <clears throat> Bless the Lord. I want you to extend your right hand this way. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. I believe you, Lord. Benny, just feel the love of these people and our brethren here at the church and feel the love of God. The Lord is faithful. He can be trusted. Brother Steve, come on over. Let's pray for it. I believe you, Lord. Lift your voices, please. I believe you, Lord. I believe you, Lord. I believe you, Lord. We believe you, Lord. We believe your word, Jesus. Yes, and amen, Jesus, your promises 
exciting thing on the face of this earth. Hallelujah. Oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. You see, God has put the power of God and the presence of God and the love of God and the goodness of God in us, and we're just so happy about it. See, everybody in this room already has eternal life. It's just a matter of where you're going to spend it. <laughs> The reason some of us are so happy is we've already decided that, and uh, that decision, yeah. That decision just uh, made us real glad. And I'll tell you, if I hadn't made that decision, and if I didn't have it made by now, uh, I'd be sad myself. But thanks, but thanks be to God, you know, we're going to a place better than this one. And checking out ain't going to be bad at all, folks. <laughs> Whether by rapture or by death, it ain't going to be bad at all. Uh, I've never, never watched a Christian die, and I've watched uh, probably hundreds of people die, and I've never watched a person that really knew the Lord Jesus Christ, their personal Savior, in a panic at their death. You know why? Because I believe God just, the death angel comes. 
But I believe God sends those supporting angels, and they outnumber that death angel so much until their presence is so wonderful and sweet until all the fear and all the dread and all of the, the, the things about the unknown out there on the other side, the way we get over there, uh, all of that's removed and gone. And, uh, you know, I want to live as long as God wants me to live, but I'll tell you what, I don't dread going to heaven at all. Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> you may be seated. We're so happy that you're here. I know some of you, how many of you stood in line in the rain today? Huh? God bless your hearts. I'm going to tell you something. God saw you standing out there. And you know what? God was saying to those, uh, those people in heaven, those angels in heaven, said, look down there. You see those people standing in line? They're going to get a special blessing. I'm telling you right now, God saw every, uh, saw every last one of you, and God's got a special blessing for you tonight. So don't leave without getting your blessing. Okay? God's going to give it to you in abundance. We're glad you're here. We're honored that you're here. On behalf of our pastor and, and our uh, board of uh, directors and our deacons and our congregation, our staff, we're just so pleased and thrilled that you're here. It's an honor to have you, and we want to just love on you, okay? Everybody, you just relax and let us love on you. That's what we like to do, and uh, that's what God's called us to do, and we just want to do that. And uh, in a few minutes, uh, the Word's going to be preached, and these chairs are going to be gone. This altar's going to be filled with repentant people, and your heart's going to be blessed and set on fire with, the, with what you're going to see here. And then after that, we're going to follow it with a wonderful prayer time of a refreshing and anointing upon people's lives, and people will be healed and filled with the Spirit and blessed. And I'm telling you, the best is yet to come. Lendl is great, and the praise and worship is great, but the greatest is yet to come. Hallelujah. <laughs> is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. the spirit of the sovereign God is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news he has sent to the poor to bind up the broken hearted to bring freedom to the captive and release the ones in darkness
We bless you, Lord. 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 Glory, glory. I want to tell you, friend, God loves to hear from you. He loves to hear from you. He loves to hear your praises. He loves to hear your worship. And if you're not accustomed to this, you need to get accustomed to it. Amen. You've got to learn how to praise Him. We spend so much time praising one another and blessing one another. We need to learn how to praise Him. Let's just, one more time, Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord. We worship you. Jesus. would like for everyone to remain standing just for a minute, if you would. Those of you at home, if you would stand also. We welcome those that are listening by radio. God bless you for tuning in. I love this revival. And um, we didn't start this revival. God started it. Um, we're not maintaining it. God is maintaining it. We're praying. We pray every week. There's an intercessory prayer meeting. There's a lot of other prayer that goes on. Revival is pastors listen up. Revival is brought in by prayer and it's sustained by prayer. You got to keep praying. We didn't start it. We're not maintaining it. And we certainly can't finish it. It's something God's doing. But I stand amazed, for those of you visiting for the first time, how 2.1, over 2.1 million people have come through these doors. And if you could have been, if you could have been in our shoes, and we only see, you know, I'm a one life, and I can see just a certain group of people every night that, you know, I come in contact with, and then Mike and Pastor Richard, everyone sees a revival from their point of view, and is in contact with people from their, from in, the, in their field of, of work. But as I look at the lives that have been changed, the thousands and thousands and thousands of lives that have been changed, and uh, this last week was just a phenomenal week. This is a brand new week, but you know, this last week, the drug addicts that came to Jesus in this place, and the kid, one kid hit, pulled up his arm, and he had these tracks up and down his arms. He said, well, Jesus, help me with this. And to be able to look at people and say, yeah. As a matter of fact, he's good at that. <laughs> he can set you free. He can deliver you. Glory. But I've never, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen God move in power like he's moving. I've seen, I've seen like most of us in this room, we've seen spots of it. You know, God moving in areas of the world or at times in our churches, but I've never just seen a constant outpouring to where you can confidently say to someone who's addicted, yeah, tonight God's going to do that. 
or you can confidently say to someone who is backslidden, God will forgive you tonight. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. Someone who's never known the Lord, he'll set you free. We've had witches, warlocks in this place. We've had people from, we've had Muslims saved, saved Buddhists saved. It's, it's just amazing to watch God's power come down. We want to welcome everyone tonight. Uh, this is a um, unique night in that It'll never be lived like this. There will never be a day like today, never be a night like tonight ever again. This is very special. Everyone is here assembled under God's appointment. As a matter of fact, we have two busloads about to pull up that missed God's appointment, but they're going to make it tonight. They're coming in from Oklahoma, so if somebody tries to get your seat when you're up to the bathroom, I'd just stick around, friend. I wouldn't go to the bathroom tonight because... <laughs> They're just, we just got a call. There's two buses coming in from Oklahoma that are going to want to get in here tonight, and we're going to try to cram them and not put them in, in some of our overflows. But um, they are coming under God's appointment. Everyone here is here under God's appointment. Those of you listening at home and watching by video, however you got this tape, it was a God thing. God put it in your hands. And I want everyone to pray with me tonight, whether you love God or not. Now, I know there's a lot of people here that love God. There's a lot of people that don't love God. There's a lot of people that, that, that are upset at God, mad at God. Maybe something happened uh, recently in your life. Maybe you lost a loved one. Maybe a business deal fell through and you've gone flat broke and you're bitter at God. Uh, everyone in this room is unique. Whether you love God, hate God, backslidden, never known the Lord, I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. Okay, this is a simple prayer. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. We've had people come in here and get saved that have never known the Lord, never prayed before. And uh, they prayed this prayer at the beginning of the meeting. Non-believers, but they were obedient and they prayed this prayer. You know, it, they basically saying, if you're out there, God, then touch my life. Jesus, speak to my heart and touch me. I want everyone to pray this out loud together right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now we want you to know that this revival is being pastored. John Kilpatrick is pastoring the revival. We have a pastoral staff. I'm the visiting evangelist. Just been visiting for a while. <laughs> but we are not here to control this thing, okay? And I want the pastors that are visiting before I share tonight's message to let you know that we don't control this. The Holy Spirit is uh, in charge of these meetings. There are meetings where he spontaneously begins to move. Heaven comes down and just, just, he just sweeps us all away. That happened last Saturday night. Uh, and those of you that were here, we had the longest sustained praise I've ever heard in my life in this place. It was just the decibels. I don't know what it registered on our machines, but it was phenomenal to hear it just go on and on and on. Heaven came down. Hundreds and hundreds of people repented. We've had nights like that. We've had nights where you can hear moaning and groaning. It goes on for hours. Every single night is different. We yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And that is something, if you want revival in your church, we're not sharing with you how to. And we can't do that because we don't know. We're still learning. But one thing we do know is yielding, obedience to the Holy Spirit is a key. It's a key. That means, Pastor, if you sense God is doing something, stand back. And make sure you're not getting in the way. And that's so important in, the, in these meetings. And so I want you to know ahead of time that, that things are going to happen tonight. And it may look to you like things are out of control. They're not out of control. We just let God have his way. Uh, in a few minutes, people will be prayed for. And uh, heaven's going to come down. Things do, people do things they've never done before. You know, when Saul of Tarsus got saved, he did things he'd never done before. If you read that in Acts chapter 9, he, he bit the dirt and uh, was blinded, was led away. You know, stuff happened to him when he got right with God. We've had that happen. I remember one night praying with a Muslim. Well, I didn't know if he believed or not. He just looked at me like I was a, a cuckoo, you know, and, and I said, can I pray with you? And we have a lot of folks coming here. They don't believe anything that's going on, but they want to put God to the test. Is anybody listening? They just want to put God to the test, and they'll come up and they'll stand just like this in front of you, you know, like snots, you know, and just, 
And so, um, and we'll pray for them. And we've had stuff happen to these folks, friend, it's hilarious because it's God coming on the scene, showing himself powerful, and then they, they come up out of whatever happened to them believing in the power. Now, some of you, this may mess up your theology, but I don't believe every single person has to be led to Jesus first through a scriptural program and then get saved. I believe they can get hit by the power of God and then get saved. I believe that. And I believe, I believe that's, happened, that's what happened in Acts chapter 9 with Saul of Tarsus. Because if you had gone up to Saul of Tarsus with a, with a chick track or some gospel track with the Romans' road to salvation, he'd have had you thrown in prison. He wasn't concerned about the Romans' way to salvation. He wasn't concerned about how to, how to, how to get to heaven. He wasn't, he wasn't even written yet. <laughs> Matter of fact, he was going to write it. But uh, he wasn't concerned about all that, friend. He wanted to kill Christians. So you're not going to go up to him and witness. But the power came down, and then you could talk to him. And so that's what happens in this place. So some of you that are skeptics, the power of God's going to come down over you. God bless you. Many of you that walked in here will not walk out. Okay? You won't walk out. And um, I've had stuff happen to me in this place that I've never, ever dreamed of in my life. And it may not ever happen again, but one particular night, another particular night, stuff happens in this place. How many are willing for stuff to happen to you? If, if you'll read this book, now, we, don't, we believe in discipleship, raising up people, following God, whether you feel it or not. But in the Word, if you look at the early church, stuff happened. You know, they hung out with angels. That's stuff. Okay? They, angels were just there, hanging out with the early church. Miracles, signs, and wonders were always around the early church. It's time for that to happen again. And so in a few minutes, uh, God is going to begin to move and let him have his way. Okay? Amen? Amen. Those of you that are, um, uh, every now and then I try to give an update on the, the, what's going on with the mark of the beast. And uh, one, of today's, one of these days, we're going to compile a lot of this, but it's just, um, I believe we're right at the, um, the edge of, um, of the mark. I don't believe everyone's just going to, you know, one day you're going to get a phone call, get down here to the bank, get your mark, and you can't use money. You know, it, you know and it's not going to be like that. But the technology is here. And uh, before um, I open the word tonight, um, Here's from the couple days ago, the newspaper. Forget your PIN number, okay? PIN numbers and ATM machines and stuff like that are as much as you might love them. Those are archaic, very archaic, and the banks know it. They know, you know, people get robbed at ATM machines all the time. Having to walk around with a card is archaic. Having to memorize a PIN number is archaic. All this stuff is archaic. Well, here, um, here is a forget your PIN number. Just look into the camera. Everybody's pupil is different. Everybody's eye is different, and, uh, and this technology is out right now, and you, where anyone in this room could, could go into a bank and walk up to the camera, and they would take a picture of your eye. It is more, they're, they're, you're, that is even more accurate than your fingerprint. That's how varied everyone's eye is. And you think of this, friend, no, no ink, no nothing. Just walk up and takes a picture of your eye. And so when, and that's, that's coded, that's, that's, that's programmed. And so you go up to an ATM machine and you just stand there. Think about it, friend. It can be voice activated. You stand there and you'll say, $20, please. And it reads your eye, it's you, okay? And so the technology is here. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I, say th I say these things, I share this with you for a reason, because there's people that live in another world. And I want you to wake up, friend. I really want you to wake up. I want you to quit thinking that this is going to happen in somebody else's lifetime. John Wesley could not share the things we're sharing. Neither could they at the turn of the century at Azusa Street. These things are happening right now. It's never been like this. It's moving much faster. All the technology for the mark is ready. It's just we're not. We're not ready. And these little ads, these little things, they show a description here in the newspaper of your eye, exactly how the camera's going to work. And they're talking about security, your own security, securing your bank account, securing your money. And that's how it's going to be approached. This is good for you. 
This is going to help you. The chip, whatever it might be with the mark, is going to be good for you. That's how it's going to be approached. If you're, if you're going to have a baby, they'll say, listen, would you, what do you think about kidnapping? It's a horrific crime. It's a horrible crime. Well, we can prevent kidnapping. If someone steals your baby, we can identify your baby anywhere it goes through this satellite chip. Let us just implant this chip in your child, and this also will be the baby's number. But anytime your child is anywhere, when your child is 14 and says he's going over to Johnny's house and doesn't go to Johnny's house but goes to Susie's house, you'll look on the computer screen and you'll see Johnny at Susie's house. And all the young people went, oh my. <laughs> but that technology is already here, okay? As a matter of fact, I've carried around, uh, I left it back at the office today, but I've carried around a, a little, um, a, it's a little gun that where they're using right now on animals, it, and it's got a chip. They just poke the needle in, they push the chip in, and to where you can find out where your cattle are, where your horse is at, where your cat's at. The technology is here. You need to keep your eyes open, and if you're not right with God, you need to get right with God. Are those scare tactics? Yeah. <laughs> sure are. I'd be shaking in my boots if I wasn't saved. <laughs> I mean, if I was not saved, friend, I'd be scared right now. I would. I was at a checkout counter at Walmart just a few months ago and started talking about the mark of the beast because, you know, we're just waving all these things over there. And, I, and uh, I used a credit card and I said, you know, it won't be long. We won't need these things. She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, people just wave their hand across that little thing and it'll deduct the amount from their bank account. And she said, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. Don't talk to me about that. She knew exactly what I was talking about. It's called the mark. And you won't be able to buy or sell unless you have it. And any dodo can tell right now we're right at the verge of it. You walk up to a Coke machine and put your hand up to the Coke machine and out will come a Coke. If you don't have a dollar in your account, you don't get a Coke. Speak to my heart. Change my life. Turn with me to Psalm 92. Nope, 42. Excuse me. Psalm 42. Something is going on. Got a letter in the mail. We got a, just a ton of letters. This came just the other day. And um, talked about a man. Let's see. He became a different person overnight. Let's see. Um, this man visited the revival. My father-in-law didn't think music in the church ought to sound like that. <laughs> Lindell's hair was too long. He was... My father-in-law was bought, he was taught in the, bought in the Baptist seminary, he was taught in the Baptist seminary that things like this were not God, but he was starving spiritually and he was sick physically. Can I say that again? That Brownsville thing's not of God, but he's starving spiritually and sick physically. See, that's the key, friend. You have your people out there that aren't hungry, they could care less. They're doing just fine, thank you, with their religion. Religion is normal. Sunday morning, maybe a Sunday night, maybe a Wednesday night, but don't get me involved. They're not hungry spiritually, but people that are hungry spiritually, check out the waters. They want to find out, is there more? How many believe there's more? I can't read this word without knowing that there's more out there. Unless your shadow healing the sick, is healing the sick, I think there's more. And if your shadow is healing the sick, I want you to stand. Because we got some work for you to do. But he was starving spiritually and he was sick physically. The first night that he came, I preached a message that says right here, entitled, Watching Jesus Die. My in-laws were hooked. They even stayed for prayer after the service. Pastor prayed with my mother-in-law. Dad asked one of the prayer team members to pray with him about the, his diabetes. 
By the way, we have a prayer team, a huge prayer team tonight. It makes absolutely no difference who prays for you as long as they're wearing a badge on tonight. They're part of the prayer team. Listen to what happened here. He had one of the prayer team pray with him. If I asked how many of you would remember this, none of you would remember this because you pray for thousands of people. Dad was healed. He is a different man physically, but the big miracle is a spiritual one. He's lost 20 pounds. He will tell you that it is from all the repenting that he has done. <laughs> and everything that he's taught in the past, he listens to Lindell's music constantly. He turns it up loud. God, God is starting to use him in a Baptist church as a spiritual mentor for a young pastor that is going after God. Dad is praying for sick people and God is healing them. His, his marriage has been renewed and they're acting like newlyweds. Now you've got to be kidding. That happens at the Brownsville Revival? Think about it, friend. You can't put up a sign out front and it says revival and have 2.1 million people come through unless God's moving. I don't care how good Lyndall is. I don't care if I preach half decent, how great pastor is. People won't come halfway around the world, spend $3,000 on a ticket to hear We Will Ride. They'll buy a tape. But they come here because God is moving by His Spirit. He is changing lives. He's healing the sick. He set the captive free. God is moving. God is moving. We get reports. Where's Bill Bush at? Bill, where's that group coming in in a couple months or coming in a hundred or so folks? Where are they from? Taiwan. People are coming, think of this, friends, right now gathering up money. In some of these countries, there's not a whole lot of money going around. Gathering up money, maybe even selling homemade bread or something on the streets, getting enough money to get a ticket to go where? To Disney World? No. Brownsville. Why? Spirit of God's moving. It's moving. So those of you that have come tonight, and how many have come tonight? <laughs> Several of them were out there going, it's not a trick question. <laughs> if you've come tonight, God is going to touch your life. Psalm 42. Matter of fact, Pastor, I want to read this out of your Bible. <laughs> hey, he's got to turn to the right scripture. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love John Kilpatrick. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, Psalm 42, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down, verse 6, within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and the Hemonites from the hill Misar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me in my prayer unto the God of my life. Verse 9, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Verse 7, deep calls unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me now we've asked the lord tonight to speak to our hearts and to change our lives how many meant that 
The imagery here of this psalm is that of a waterfall, water rushing violently into an already agitated sea. Water hits the sea and the waves roll over it. Here the psalmist is speaking of the state of his own soul being submersed under a sea of affliction. This is a psalm of loneliness. Now I want everyone to listen tonight. Please don't allow yourself to be distracted by anything because if this doesn't fit you right now, it may fit you tomorrow morning. Let me say that again. If this doesn't fit you right now, this may fit you tomorrow morning. This is a psalm of loneliness. This man was hurting. Something was going on. We don't know if it was a psalm of David. Many theologians believe it is, many scholars, but I don't know. It's not, we're not sure. But I want to spend just a few minutes tonight using this imagery to speak about the condition of your soul. And one of the things I see in this with a waterfall coming down and the, the waves crashing in and the water meeting the water, just the agitation of it. I've been to two of the most beautiful waterfalls in the world. One is Niagara, which many of you are from that area of the world. You've been there. And the other waterfall I've been to is Iguazu down in uh, the border of Brazil and Argentina. It's where they filmed, if you remember the movie The Mission, they filmed it where they tied the man to the cross and his punishment for, for speaking about Jesus was to die on that cross and go over the waterfall and they never found his body. But I remember standing at, at, at particular uh, places at the Iguazu Falls and the roar of those falls. People could shout to you a hundred yards away, a hundred feet away, ten feet away, and you wouldn't hear them. It was just a roar, and I could imagine what it'd be like close, right next to where the waterfalls were going. And I'm, 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 I'm sharing that right now to let you know of the agitation, of the, of the turmoil of what's going on in this person's life. There's a lot that you can pull from this scripture, but please allow me to go tonight where I'm going. This message is entitled, Below the Surface. Now the Lord gave me this this morning, and he is timely. He never misses, never misses. Can I say that again? God never misses. He knows what he's up to, and in the morning I don't get up and go, oh, I hope I can preach on this, or I hope I can preach on that. I get up and I spend time with Jesus, and I say, Jesus, speak to me, Lord. What's going on? What is going to happen Wednesday night? I don't know about Thursday. I don't know if Wednesday will ever come, but tonight, Jesus, I'm going to be speaking to thousands of people. What do you want to say? I'd like to begin tonight. This is entitled Below the Surface. I'd like to begin tonight by relaying to you something I've seen for many, many years. It's something that occurs every single night without exception in this revival. Something that is awesome to watch and brings joy to the very heart of God. Just a few minutes ago, when we were worshiping, this very thing happened. It had to do with souls, living souls, spirits, human beings getting in touch with their creator. A few minutes ago, when we were worshiping in the Lord, some of us were singing in tongues, others were just worshiping, others were saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. This place filled up with harmony. Did you hear it? Were you part of it? And I thought of what that must be like in heaven. What is that like up there? For God Almighty, you know, it's almost, I can, I can imagine because this has gone on for two and a half years. We're almost, com we're completing our third year of revival pretty soon. I can imagine that heaven pretty much depends on that. You know, that there's a group of people down there on Cervantes Street, on Mobile Highway, that are going to worship me. I know they're going to worship us. They're going to worship us. They're going to worship us. Lyndall Cooley's going to come out. The place is going to erupt. Some are going to fall on their face. Others are going to clap. They're going to sing. They're going to dance. And it's almost like the, the heaven just tunes in. Here they come. There has never been a service where we've walked out here and gone, oh, man, let's sing a hymn and go home. Friend, it's always been going after God, worshiping the Lord. It's awesome to behold. I've related several times in this revival a story that you'll find in the, 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 the book that I've written, Time to Weep. And this has to do, friend, with, with people going after God. Now, remember the title tonight is Below the Surface. What God does in this revival meeting, and Lord, help me tonight not to get ahead of you. Because I know you're up to something, Jesus. I don't want to get ahead of you. 
But I watch in these meetings. You see, we see things you don't see. You may be in a pew and you just got a couple pews in front of you and your, your, your scope is basically what you see on the platform. But see, we see the faces of a lot of people. And we see the balcony. And I watch people, maybe during worship. I watch somebody come into the service cold and hard, difficult. You can tell that they're crusty. And halfway through the worship, maybe about 7.45, that's one of the reasons worship goes on and on, friend. If we sang two songs and went into preaching, 75% of the people that attend here would never get saved. Because there's a softening that goes on. And I'll watch people come in and, and they'll stand there cold and hard and maybe three quarters of an hour through it, they'll begin, you know, feeling something. And, and a grown man will do this. He'll wipe a tear from his eyes. And, or he'll, he'll sit down and his wife will sit down next to him and they'll, he'll put his head on her shoulder or vice versa and they'll weep together. Something's going on. A few minutes ago, I saw a husband and a wife sitting in their seat while everyone else was standing. They were sitting there. He had his hand up. She had his hand, her hand up. And they were just crying, un, just un, unashamedly. They just wept openly. And what was going on? I don't know, friend. But it was deep. It was deep. Maybe that's the first time that's ever happened in their marriage. Maybe they came to this revival saying, God, if you don't do something in my heart, if you don't come deep down inside of me, Jesus, then I'm going to be the most miserable person on this earth because I am right now, and I've come to this revival. You've got to touch me. But see, I've seen some things, friend. I've seen God move. And this one particular instance was in, uh, was in Chile. We've seen it here at the Brownsville Revival a lot. But let me just share this one with you. This was in 1991. It was at a city park. And I remember walking out to the city park. It's a wealthy area of the city. And uh, see, tonight what God is going to do, he's going to get below the surface. And I'm going I'm I'm to define the surface in just a minute. But in this city park, this was a wealthy area of the city. As a matter of fact, the mayor of the city was watching us from her office. And uh, we'd asked permission to preach the gospel in the city. She gave me the pre permission to preach it right in front of her, you know, to keep an eye on us. And so we were out there preaching. And I had Larry R., a dear friend of mine, play. He was singing the song, People Need the Lord. It's a beautiful song, People Need the Lord. And he sang it in Spanish, Tienen que saber. People need the Lord. People, they got to know about Jesus. And uh, it was filling this plaza. We had a, a PA system that was working, which was a blessing. And it was filling the plaza. And it was, a, it, I remember looking, the trees were gorgeous. We have pictures of this. It was just one of those ornate plazas with all kinds of mosaic work and the beautiful stones and just a beautiful, beautiful plaza. The center of town where everybody walks through and, and talks and, and uh, have, they have coffee together. It's just a real beautiful place in the city. And as he was singing that song, I began to watch people. They were walking by and they just stopped. And he was just singing and he's got a beautiful voice, but I knew it was something beyond his voice. And then he stopped the song and just the music played. Just the music. And more people came. Hundreds of people began to come. And I stood out with a microphone and I began to speak to them. And I began to talk to him about the cross and the blood. And I remember looking at people and I said, where are you going, sir? Where are you going with that briefcase? Off to work. That's good. You're providing for your family. But what about tomorrow? What about the next day? What about the next day? Have you ever found you never can get a big enough house? You can't get a better car. You really can't get exactly what you want in life. There's always another need out there, isn't there? He would nod at me. And how about you, ma'am? Where are you going? And how about you, young lady? And a large group of young people walked by. They were coming from school. And they were all dressed in their uniforms, walking through the plaza. And they all stopped. There's probably about 120, 200 of these kids. We got pictures of these too. They stopped, and I walked up to one of them. Everyone could hear I was speaking through a microphone. I said, what's your name? She said, Marsha. I said, what's going on with you? She said, I want to cry. I said, why do you want to cry? She said, I just want to cry. And I said, Marsha, look at me. Cry. 
cry, just cry, 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 just cry, God. And then I stood back and I realized that God was in the park. God was in the park and everybody was listening. Everybody was ready. And this went on for one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. He was just plain old there. God was in the park. People were walking by. Everyone was getting saved. And that's what I wrote down here. Blessed be his name forever. The fasting continues. We're on the seventh day of a fast. Rich presence of the Lord in the services. The hills melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. Over 500 have been saved. Tears of joy, new life. There's hope. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I can't begin to explain the joy. The presence of the Lord in the plaza is cutting like a knife. No one moves. So many saved. In the tent at night, no room for the people. What is that, friend? I remember a young Mormon came running up to me and fell on his face just like this on his knees in front of me. And he said, I want to know your God. And cars began to pull in front of the plaza and stop. They stop in traffic. They just stopped and sat there. And people would go beep, 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 beep. And they would just sit there. And I'd go up to the cars and knock on the windows. They'd roll it down. I said, what's going on? They said, you tell us. There's something in the plaza. And I, and, and I remember I would get in the back seat of the cars. And I'd lead them to Jesus right there in the plaza. They'd get saved right there. What is it? We see the same exact thing happening here at the Brownsville Revival all the time. The Spirit of God begins to move. God begins to move among the people. Someone in the back can be weeping. Someone in the, in the chapel can be moaning and groaning. Someone back in the cafeteria can be all distraught, coming out of themselves, going, my God, what's going on? It's called the presence of God, and your spirit is starving for it. I've watched this occur with every type individual common to man, the intellectual, the ignorant, regardless of your race or nationality or religious background. And let me give you some points on this title below the surface. Most people spend very little time below the surface. We're a bunch of gamers, friend. Stay with me, I'll explain that. This won't take long. There's already some folks in this room, you're under conviction, I can feel it. Let me say it another way. Most people spend the majority of their time on the surface. By surface, I mean they concentrate on tantalizing and satisfying the five senses. Sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touching. Bible school students, I want you to listen to me. Many of you are here for the next semester. You've just come in. It's fresh. God's going to touch you tonight. He's going to speak to you tonight. The very reason you are here is because of this message. That's why you're in this service tonight. That's why you've come to the Bible school. This is a preliminary. This is preempting everything that's going to happen to you. This is why you've come to the Bible school. It's because you've moved away from those five senses, those animalistic senses that have been driving you, have been guiding you all your life. You're sick of them. You don't want to be led like that anymore. You want to be led by the Spirit of God. You want God to guide you and direct you in the way that you should go. How many will stay with me for a few minutes? The media, television, magazines, radio, the websites all know that if they can entice you by triggering one or more of your five senses, then a great task has been accomplished. Let me give you an example. And if you're a car salesman, forgive me. But they know that if they can lure you into a showroom by waving before your eyes a flashy car, being caressed by a voluptuous female, whispering a ridiculous line like, this car will make your wildest dreams come true. <laughs> Some of 
Somebody's watching that right now somewhere, friend. Some, some Joe that's going through a hard time, he's 48, 49 or 47 or, I'm not picking on you, buddy. But he's going through a crisis. He's 53 and he's going through a crisis and he's, he's, <laughs> he's sick and tired. He's sick and tired. He's sick and tired of driving minivans. And he's watching this commercial and it's a Corvette. Fire engine red. If they can entice you for just a few minutes, if they can get you to swim over to their surface lure. Ever fished? You ever seen them things? I've always hated surface lures because they're just so dumb to me. They're on the top of the water until I caught a fish with one. You know? I said, this is a wiggler, man. He goes, watch the action of this thing. And I go, that will never catch a fish. The fish are in the water, down there low. No, this will catch them. This will catch them. And that's what they're doing, man. They're wiggling that thing across the surface of your life. Wiggle it around a little bit. Say things like 1.8% interest. No money down. No payments until September 1998. Pick your color. Pick your upholstery. Pick your floor mats. We'll monogram them for free. <laughs> it's all surface. You buy the car. Your other car was just fine. Now you're strapped with a couple tons of metal that depreciated $3,000 when you drove it off the lot. I'm telling the truth. Let me just go ahead and finish here. I was in a store in Costa Rica. It wasn't a store, it was a factory. And I preached a message one night called um, God Snubs Snots in this place. And I may have shared this story in there. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He snubs snots. If you're a snot, he's, he doesn't want anything to do with you. He resists you. But I was in this store in Costa Rica and while I was doing, I was doing the research on the snob, and I, and I found out there's a term called snob appeal. And it's a, it's a uh, those of you that are in the clothing profession, you've used it before. It's what appeals to snobs, okay? And it sells big, big money. You go to some of the ritzy shopping malls in this nation, you know, the ones that are not just a common man mall, the ones that got all those stores that say, you know, they'll, they'll say, bunkies, you know, and inside there'll be three pieces of clothing. You know, and you, you, you know you've seen that piece of clothing at Goodwill. <laughs> but you walk in there, and it couldn't be the piece of clothing you saw at Goodwill because it's $464. And it looks like it was made out of a handkerchief or something. But, but I walked into this place, and that's snob appeal, okay? You know, I've got this at Bunkies, you know? Where did you get that? Saks. Where'd you get that? Kmart. <laughs> Kmart. I wouldn't buy a shirt at Kmart. Well, you just did, Bubba. You just paid, you just paid sixty-five dollars more than I did. But you bought that shirt at Kmart. I'm gonna get you below the surface, and it kills me. How many want to know the truth? I want to know the truth. I'm tired of being scammed. I want to know the truth. The sight. Listen to some of this. The senses. The vision of a young woman. If you look at magazine articles, they'll have, they'll have a, a $879 suit. But if you wear that suit, this brunette will come up to you and rub your lapels. All right? That's what the ad looks like. If you wear that suit, this is what you'll get. They're going after your sight. They're dealing with the surface here. They know if they can get this in your eyes, you'll go, what quality, what beauty. Much better than, than, than video cassettes. Much better than what I've seen before. I'll take it. I'll buy it. How about sound? Bose offers its worldwide web browsers. You click onto their page, you can hear full, rich, lifelike stereo sound never before possible. How about taste? Merit cigarettes. Say this, if you'll switch down to lower tar and you'll find our smooth, satisfying, satisfying taste. Switch down to lower tar. Merit cigarettes. Taste. Coffee Mate says, your taste buds will sing the moment they encounter the creamy richness of Coffee Mate French Vanilla. Try it and see if they do. Take a sip and see if they go, ah. Wow. 
How about sound? Bose offers its worldwide web browsers. You click onto their page, you can hear full, rich, lifelike stereo sound, never before possible. How about taste? Merit cigarettes. Say this, if you'll switch down to lower tar and you'll find our smooth, satisfying, satisfying taste. Switch down to lower tar. Merit cigarettes. Taste. Coffee Mate says your taste buds will sing the moment they encounter the creamy richness of Coffee Mate French vanilla. Try it and see if they do. Take a sip and see if they go, ah. Wow. Hear that, baby? You can harmonize together at coffee time. <laughs> Smell. How many magazines are filled with the odor from Chanel or Elizabeth Arden, you know, scratch and sniff, or peel the top off and peel the tape off and sniff? Anybody listening tonight? <laughs> or touch. How about Chrysler's new Cirrus with luxurious glove soft leather trimmed interior? Rub it, friend. You don't need interior like that. You know what you need in your car, friend? You need a bench. <laughs> Keep you awake, man. You don't need glove-like soft interior. Where are you going? <laughs> they put those in coffins. You need a bench, man, to sit there and stay alert. You don't need some massage seat. I'm working on it, friend. <laughs> he said preaching. I said, I'm working on it. Most people spend very little time below the surface. We spend, and if you'll take a good look at your life, you might spend 90% of it right on the surface. All these little things are what entice you. That's what gets my goat. That's what cranks my tractor. That's what I want in life. I got to have that. I got to have this. This turns me on. Well, friend, it's time to go a little bit deeper. Point number two. Point number two. Below the surface of every man, woman, and child lies the true meaning of your existence, of their existence. Below the surface, and if you'll stay with me just for a few minutes more, below the surface, this is where I live. This is where I live, friend, below the surface. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to snorkel or skin dive. But if you, if, you're, if you can take it, it's awesome. And my wife and I have had the privilege of doing that. And we've, we've gone to places where it's actually beautiful and the coral's beautiful and the fish are beautiful. And you can look out at the beach and the waters and go, man, this place is gorgeous. But I want to tell you, friend, you ain't seen nothing until you put on that mask and gone under the surface of the water. I took Jerry out just a few weeks ago, and we were down in some islands the south of Florida, and I said, um, and we're just waste time. And I said, and, I, I, and I, I dove in the water, I'd already been swimming out there, I took her back out there to see what I saw. I said, you're not gonna believe who's swimming out here with us. <laughs> and we went out there, and you stick your mask under the water, and it's paradise. The colors were phenomenal. The greens, the reds, the blues. I mean, some of those fish were like a foot long, and that's what got Jerry out of the water. Because <laughs> they'll swim right up to you like this. But under the water, that's where you wanted to stay, is under the water. I mean, I love above the water, but under the surface. Dear God, it's quiet. It's serene. It's beautiful. It's Phenomenal. The sun was shining through the water. The fish were just having the time of their lives, I guess, just doing what fish do, looking at humans, looking at them. <laughs> below the surface. And I'm telling you tonight, friend, below the surface of your skin, below the surface of your five senses, there exists a part of you that is waiting to be discovered, that is going to, if you will spend a few minutes tonight allowing that part of you to come out and taking a good look at it, your life will never be the same. The very thing that makes you tick lies below the surface. That's why we've had some fanatics come here. You know, there's people that have left everything to come to this Bible school. See, that should be normal. 
That should be normal. If someone in your community leaves everything and, and goes off and starts preaching on the streets, that's normal behavior. And if that bothers you, you should check yourself and get a tape of this message and listen to it again. Because what you are is carnal. You are a surface individual. What they've done is gone a little bit deeper and they've realized there's more to life than what I can get with my hands or see with my eyes or touch or eat or hear. There's more to life than all of that. The very thing that makes you tick lies below the surface. Just as the face of a clock can be exquisite. Listen to this, friend. A clock can be beautiful on the outside, gorgeous grandfather clock with exquisite Roman numerals, hand-painted, one of those clocks that has all the exquisite flowers around the dial of it, and just, just a masterpiece. That may be nice, and a lot of people look like that on the outside, but it doesn't make a difference to me unless it has a movement inside. What good is a clock that looks good standing in your corner if it don't work? What's going on with the guts? Does it have Swiss craftsmanship inside? Outside is finery and elegance. Inside, and if you're a watch repairman, you'll understand. Inside the machinery, are there coil springs? Is there a fiuse? Is there a spiral hairspring? Is there a lever escapement? Are there jeweled bearings? What is inside that thing? Is there really a clock inside that clock? That's what I'm asking about you, friend. What's inside you? What's going on here, friend? Are you just adorned nicely on the outside? But what is below the surface? Whoo! The sign outside may say fine dining. The building may look gorgeous. And the table set with sterling and fine china. But I could care less what it looks like outside. Some of the best restaurants I've ever eaten at in my life look like dumps. But you get inside, and there's a line of 822 people lined up outside. They're all trying to get inside this shack. Why? There's only three tables. Why isn't there four? Because they don't want four tables. They want three tables. The owners want three tables because that's what Grandma had in their house. 462 years ago, and that's what they're going to have, bless God, three tables, and if you want to eat here, you're going to wait till midnight. And then you read in the New York Times, one of the top restaurants in America, you know, Joe's Diner. You went there. It looked like the pits outside, but below the surface was a chef who was a master at his art. And people would wait for hours and they'll pay $79 a plate just to taste of this chef's exquisite cuisine. How about it, friend? Are you understanding what I'm talking about? I think you're beginning to understand. No matter what something looks like on the outside, the inside is what counts. Say that with me. No matter what something looks like on the outside, the inside is what counts. Good. We are listening tonight. Well, there's a place called deep, and the flesh doesn't want to go there. There's a place called deep. This is not a point. This is just a point, okay? Just note takers. It's just sort of there somewhere. There's a place called deep, and the flesh doesn't want to go there. Mike shared a few minutes ago. He said, Nancy, talk to you about going deeper. That's a beautiful husband-wife relationship right there, friend, when a husband and wife encourage one another in the Lord. Go deeper. Why does she say that? He's the spiritual head of the family, and she knows there's something underneath the surface of the water. Now, Mike's a deep man, but he knows there's deeper depths. There's more places to go. How many understand that? There are signs and wonders. See, I don't know how satisfied you are. I'm not satisfied until my shadow heals the sick. I would like to see that. When my shadow heals the sick, then I won't be satisfied then either, okay? Because I want to see the dead jump out of graves. I want to see things happen. Why? It's called going deeper with God, with this revival. Those of you that think we just prance in here every night and go, oh boy, here we go again. Friend, we crawl in this place. You'll often see us on our face before God. I'll get on my knees on this platform and go after God and weep tears. What is that? I'm not happy. I'm thrilled with God, but I'm not happy with what's going on. I want more. 
I'm thrilled. Aren't you happy with 2.1 million people and all these hundreds of thousands getting right with God? Of course that thrills me, friend. But there's 260 million people in America and there are 6 billion people in the world. And I want to see a move of God. I want to see heaven come down. I want to go deeper. There's a place called deep, and the flesh doesn't want to go there. It's a place of revelation, a place of inspiration, a place in, that every man, woman, and child in this room has got to go. You hear me? You got to go there. You got to go to the place called deep, and it's below the surface. It's way below the surface. Can I say something to those of you that are caught in sin right now? You grab one of those surface lures. You bit it. And now you've been reeled in. Tonight, the Lord's going to loose that thing from your mouth. He's going to loose it from your mouth. The line's going to be cut. You're going to spit that lure out. You ain't going to fall for that junk no more. You're not going to be looking for those little wiggly lures. Young people at the Bible school, whatever your age is at this Bible school, quit falling for that garbage. Let me tell you, when you go out to that class, you sit there and there's a teacher in front of you that's teaching us class. He's the one you're watching. Not Susie Q across the, across the class. Not Billy Joe over there. No, not, no Big Bob from Texas. You're watching the teacher. Devil, throw that lure out there and go, this is bridal school. This is bridal school. They say you need to wait, that there's rules against this, but if you don't get him now, somebody else will. This is bridal school. Tell him how good he looks today. Just tell him how good he looks. Tell him how good he looks. So you walk by and you go, hi, my name is Nancy. What's your name? Bill. Where are you from? Texas. Bill, I just want to tell you, I just want to tell you, Bill, that I really like them spurs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, little lady. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker, friend. Fell for it. They're laughing, but it's true, Richard, and it happens every single day. And everybody, that's why we're laughing, because it's true. There's so always something out there, friend. Get below the surface. Get deep in God. Go after Him. Go after the things of God, and don't let anybody stop you. Well, I'm going to go ahead and try to finish this thing and have Charity come sing. Point number three, Jesus Christ spent His life below the surface. Jesus Christ spent his life below the surface. God is deep. Say that with me. God is deep. His life, friend, from the very beginning, I mean, when he was a child, he said, I got to be about my father's business. You know what that was? Way below the surface. You know what he was saying? I don't play with tinker toys. I don't play with Legos. I don't play with dolls. I'm not going to go play in your fort. I got to be about my father's business. The kid was deep. He was deep. And when he got time for his, his, his temptation in the wilderness and he was offered all these surface lures, if you'll worship me, I'll give you all this, Jesus. He said, get behind me, devil. I ain't going to fall for that stuff because I'm deep. I am deep. Early on, friend, you'll read in the scriptures of how deep God is. The Bible said, you remember when, when uh, Samuel was going to anoint the next king and, and he was at Jesse's house, the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance. I'm talking about God is deep, friend. Quit looking at his face or at the height of his stature, Samuel, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 
God is deep. Say it with me. God is deep. He can go beyond all the surface garbage in our lives and see the true heart of man. He'll baffle your imagination. Those of you at the Bible school, and excuse me for just mentioning the Bible school several times tonight, but I'm proud of these folks. I love you dearly. But some of the most unusual people from the Bible school are going to be anointed in a way that will baffle your imagination. They'll be, and you'll go, him? Yeah, him. You want to know why? He's deep. And you're not. That's why he's got an anointing. Because he went deep. It's like the nerds in school. You remember them? They didn't want to party. They didn't want to smoke dope. They didn't want to, and we didn't want them to hang out with us anyhow. But now, you know, they're the Bill Gates of the world. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they were into another world, friend, and that's, that's, a, that's a carnal realm out there. But they were into a whole different ball game. You know, back then, they were sitting in class thinking about protons and electrons and plutons and everything else. And, you know, you were thinking about, man, when's this class going to be out? They were sitting in chemistry going, this is great, man. I can't wait for chemistry three and chemistry four and trig. And you were going, I can't wait for recess. But Jesus was deep, friend. Everywhere he went, in Matthew chapter 9, you'll see where Jesus was healing a man sick of the palsy. And he said, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And people started mumbling and grumbling. And Jesus said, knowing their thoughts, this is in Matthew 9, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Jesus went straight for the heart. He knew what's going on inside of people. You know, another person, Zacchaeus, I thought about this this afternoon right before I got to the, the church. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a surface man. Zacchaeus was into money. Money, honey, that's what he wanted. He wanted your taxes. He wanted to scarf up some for himself. He was making money. He was a surface man. And he shimmied up the tree. He wanted to get a look at Jesus. You got to get in the Lord's view, by the way. He was in the Lord's view up in that tree. Jesus saw him and said, Zacchaeus, this is my translation, get down here, you're going to get deep. I'm going to take you deep, Zacchaeus. And it wasn't long in the presence of the Lord. Zacchaeus was saying, hey, whatever I've done, I'll give it back. And I'll give what, four times? What I've taken back. Zacchaeus, in the presence of the Lord, Zacchaeus went from being a carnal man to a deep man. Jesus was deep. Say that with me. Jesus was deep. God is a great deep. Who can by searching find out the limits of the Almighty? I'm just going to give you a few statements here about God. His thoughts are deep. Psalm 92, verse 4 and 5. I'm going to close in just a minute. Charity, act like you're getting ready. For those of you listening by radio, every now and then, here in the revival, we get people that are tired and Wondering when the message is going to be over. And so when I say something like charity, act like you're getting ready, they go, oh, bless God, man. You know, the lady's going to sing. <laughs> There's just a handful of them here, but I do that just for them because we love them. Psalm 92, verse 4 and 5 says this, For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. His thoughts are deep. God is not a surface God, friend. That's why many of you don't get what you want when you want it. Because it's surface junk. It's all surface. God sees past that. He sees the heart of the man. He knows what you need when you need it. That's why he holds off. His wisdom and knowledge are deep. Romans 11, 33 and 34. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who, who has been his counselor? That's Romans 11, 33 and 34. That means his wisdom and knowledge is deep. You'll often hear me when you ask me to pray for you for a decision. I'll say, Jesus, 
You said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. I pray like that, friend, because I don't know the answer to your need, and you don't either, but God does. And I, what I do is I tap in, I open his treasure chest of wisdom, and I said, Jesus, you said, if anyone lack wisdom, and these two clowns here, we lack wisdom, Jesus, give us wisdom. Give him wisdom on what to do with his business decision. Is anybody listening? He's deep, friend. His love is deep. Ephesians 3. 15 through 19, you know, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the, length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 15 through 19. And his resources are deep. Psalm 78. I'm going to close. Hold on. I don't know why I keep saying that. It's not very deep. It's pretty carnal. You know what that is? I work, I'm closing pretty soon. That is such a carnal statement. You know what that's dealing with your senses? You know, your physical body's tired of sitting, you know, and it's just, be deep tonight. Let me go five more minutes, all right? Just be deep. All right. His resources, his resources are deep. Psalm 78, 8 through 15. His resources are deep. This talks about the children of God, how marvelously God met all their needs. He divided the sea, he caused them to pass through it, and he made the waters to stand as a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud, and at the night with a light of fire. He claimed the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. God is deep. His resources is deep. If you is, are deep, if you've ever heard somebody say someone has deep pockets, you know what that phrase is? That means somebody's wealthy. God has got deep pockets, okay? God has got deep pockets, friend, deep pockets. He's got plenty for everybody, and he'll share it with you if you'll live holy. Got about eight amens. He will share it with you if you'll live holy. You know, some of you folks are like, and I've been like this, you want your allowance, but you haven't done anything for it. <laughs> You ever had kids like that? Where's my allowance? The room looks like an atom bomb went off in there. There's stuff living under their bed. There's stuff growing under their pillow, crumbs and all that have come back to life. And they want their allowance. Some of us in this room got so much junk living under our, uh, under, under our bed. We got so much trash in our lives, junk that needs to be cleaned up, but we want our allowance. We go up to the Heavenly Father and say, hey, man, cough it up. You know, it's that time, you know, end of the week. I say that because my son just nailed me for his. <laughs> just a few minutes ago. Well, I believe Jesus from the cross, Mike, and I'd never thought of this before, but I believe when he said from the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. I believe he was saying, Father, you know, I'm deep their surface. Their surface. They don't know what they're doing. They have no clue that they have just crucified the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I have poured out my life. I have shed my blood. I have been beaten. I have been whipped. I have been crucified for them. And they're wagging their heads and mocking. Forgive them, they know not what they do. What a bunch of surface people. I can raise the dead in front of them, and their, their sight and their ears and their emotions are tantalized for two hours. But come daybreak the next day, they're waking up with a hangover. I raised the dead in front of them, and now they're drunk again. That's the kind of stuff that went on during Jesus' day. He would work miracles in front of the people, and then they'd just keep on sinning. Boy, I could stay on that, but I'm not. Well, tonight, and those of you taking a lot of notes, I'm sorry about all the scripture, but it's important. Matthew 6, 27 through 34. Write that down. That has to do with the lilies of the valley. Jesus was deep. He said, come on, come on, come on, come on. Quit looking. Look at the lilies. Look at the sparrows. Look, the, look at the fields. I mean, God takes care of them. Don't you think he's going to take care of you? You bunch of surface people. 
you bunch of carnal people. I don't have a place to lay my head. And all you care about is stuff. My last point tonight. Tonight, the deepness of God is calling to the deepness of your soul. I'm going to say something to every one of you in this room, those of you listening at home, those of you in your cars, you are deep. I'm going to say that to you straight across. There's not a surface person in this room. Every one of us here have got a depth in us. You've got a depth in you. Just as great as the oceans of the sea have depth, you've got a depth in you. The problem is you haven't tapped into it. You haven't tapped into it. There's a depth there that'll cause you to look at the surface of this world. It'll cause you to come back up out of the water and look across the surface and see the sand and the beach and the billows and the waves. You'll see all that and you'll go, man, I had no idea this treasure was underneath this water. You'll go back under the water and you'll spend hours with God. And you go, God, you know, there's a lot of stuff going out there. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of waterfalls and agitation. There's a lot of, there's a lot of commotion going on. But I'm deep now, God. I'm deep in you. There's a lot of anarchy at our church right now, God. There's stuff going on back in Pennsylvania. There's stuff going back back in Norway. There's problems in my family in Finland. There's this going on and this going on back in Canada. God, there's a lot of stuff going on, but here at the Brownsville Revival, I'm going to go deep. I'm going to dive. I'm going to dive. I'm going to get below the surface of the water because the depth of you is calling the depth of me. And I'm going to go deep. Jesus, you lived down there. You knew what it was all about. And I want to go down there where you're at, Jesus. I want to hang out where you're at, Jesus. And I want to see things the way you see it, Jesus. You are calling me deeper. You see, friend, this man that I read to you in the letter, he came into this place, surface, he left out deep. He left out deep in God. Now what is he doing? He's healed. His marriage is healed. And now he's praying for people, leading people in the deeper things of God. He's deep. He came in surface. I don't like Lindell's hair. I don't like that music. That's too loud. I don't like that shaking. He left out. Totally different, friend. He dove. He went deep. He went deep in the things of God. Everyone in this place, God is calling you to a deepness. I'm challenging you. I challenge you to go below the surface in just a few minutes. Let the deep of your need call out to the deep of God's fullness. The deep of God's fullness call out to the deep of your need. Let the deepness of your sin call out to the deepness of his forgiveness. No matter how low you are, no matter if you're scraping the bottom of that miry pit, friend, God is deeper. He can call you. He can minister to you. He can heal you. He can set you free. The deepness of God. See, in that park in Chile when I was preaching, that's what was happening to these people. One lady said to me, I said, what are you doing? You've been standing there for hours. She had her briefcase, well-dressed lady, had her briefcase going to work. She just stood there. I said, what are you doing? She said, I can't leave. She said, I'm nailed to the pavement. What was that? Deep calling to deep. She was saying to me, my work doesn't matter anymore. Those school kids were saying school doesn't matter anymore. It just doesn't matter anymore. What matters is what's going on in this park right now. Because my soul longeth for God. My soul's crying out. There's so many more scriptures. Those of you that are scholars in this room, please forgive me for not sharing all the scriptures. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe what I go through every day trying to prepare. I prepare a message every single day of the revival. And you can't exhaust everything. It's just impossible. So if you're thinking of all these scriptures that I should have added, pray for me. But there's a deepness. Let the deepness of God's grace reach down into the deepness of your ruined life. Let the deepness of our Savior's grief over your sins call you to a deep, sorrowful repentance. The deepness of God. Everyone stand here. Don't move the chairs yet. 
When I got saved, everyone looked this way. And by the way, folks, I know there's a lot of people here tonight. For those of you here for the whole week, it's always crowded here. Okay, so just get used to bumping into people and, you know, standing in line at the bathroom, stuff like that. Just get used to that. If we had to deal with that, you, you should see spring break in summertime. You got it easy tonight, but just get used to the crowd, okay? But when I got saved, a Lutheran minister came into my room. Everyone looked this way. Pastor, I was so tired of sin. I had gone deep into sin. How many know what I'm talking about? I had gone deep into sin. I had grabbed that surface lure that the devil had out there dangling out there, going across the surface of the water. I hook, line, and sinker got a hold of that thing, and he took me so deep into sin that I thought there was never a way out of his trap. And a Lutheran minister came into my house, and he said, Steve, Jesus can set you free. And deep inside of me came a cry, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the depth of God's love met the depth of my anguish. And friend, in a matter of seconds, I was totally set free. Jesus Christ will meet you as you tonight, friend, come out of yourself and you realize that I have fallen away from God. I am in sin. And you, the depth of your spirit, you, you've gotten away from the surface tonight. And you go, I know what the answer. The answer is to get away from this adulterous situation. The answer is to get this pornography out of my life. The answer is to, is to quit drinking and smoking and going after God. As you get past the surface, see, a lot of reasons you're drinking and smoking. Is the, it's, it's because the devil knows. He knows if God can ever take you deep in his things, you'll never fall for that trash. Ever again, friend. There ain't nothing. Those of you that love the feeling of drugs, you don't know feeling. There are times in this revival Maybe some of you have heard me at times. I'll go, oh, whoa. I mean, friend, it is heaven touching man. And it's like rushing through you. Go, dear God. And tonight, many of you, as the power of God sweeps over you, you're going to go to heaven. I mean, it's incredible what's going on in this revival. It is so deep. That's why people get up and they go, my Lord and my God. They go out to their car, they grab all the CDs, they bring them back in the church, you know, they dump them on the altar. You know, they, we've had young people come up and pulling rings out of their nose and out of their belly buttons, you know, and out of their ears and out of their eyelids, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, I mean, they're just, one girl, I'll never forget, stood right here with a jacket. You remember that girl with that jacket? She stood here with a jacket, and it must have had 864 pockets, and she was just, every pocket had something in it. She was going, what happened? She had gotten deep. And when you get deep, when you get deep, oh, nothing else matters. You look at the devil's tackle box, man, and you just shake it out. You go, oh, what a bunch of junk. He's got them little plastic wiggly worms. Jesus has night crawlers, man. He's got the real McCoy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Come on now. Jesus give you a real worm. <laughs> Everyone with the chairs moving to the left and the right. No, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> Jonah, <laughs> yeah. Jonah could talk about the deep. Yeah, that's a good one. Didn't even think of Jonah. Deep calling the deep. Boy, he was deep. But there's a part of you, friend, that's crying out tonight. And the reason I'm preaching like I preach is because I know the difference. I've been in both worlds. And I also know the difference of living halfway, sort of sold out, 
you know? Reservations here, reservations there. You know, God, you can have 90% of my life, but I'm holding on to this. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about sins. I'm talking about stuff that you just don't want to give to God, like the freedom of Him moving in your life, what He wants to do in your life, revival in your church, or moving you to the mission field, whatever it might be. You're holding back that 10%. It keeps your friend on the surface. That's like a cork. It'll keep you on the top, friend. And you snip that line. But those of you that are in sin, the difference of living totally free, and I'm talking about free of everything, okay? Listen up. In the balcony, those of you at home, I'm talking about those of you that sit in front of a TV set and can watch a PG-13 10-second clip of a woman slipping her blouse off and a man slipping his arm around her and then walking under a bedroom and crawling under the covers. You can watch that with your eyes. I'm telling you right now, sir, you're not deep. That's surface, and it'll keep you on the surface. The devil sees you watching it, and he sees the hypocrisy of your prayers. The Lord sees you watching it, and you're like a guy wanting your allowance without doing anything about it. He sees that. The Lord sees, can 10 seconds mess up my spiritual life? Brother, two seconds can mess up your spiritual life. A couple seconds can mess up your spiritual life. When you willingly, it's one thing to be walking by something and see it and turn your head and keep going. But when you stop, you know what's going on in front of you and you allow that to go across your mind. Friend, that's surface garbage. That'll keep you from going anywhere in God. Listen to what the preacher's saying tonight. I know what I'm talking about. That's why there's not much going on in America. You don't think God wants to pour his spirit out in this nation? He wants to pour his spirit out in this nation. But we're, we're a bunch of surface people, friend, carnal people. One of the reasons he poured his spirit out in the early church, you know, they dealt with the carnality. Remember what they did? They sold their lands, everything they had. They just sort of distributed everything and had all things common. You know, that was, that was, a, that was a heavy, that was a deep thing. How many say that was a deep thing? That means your boat's my boat. All right? That means you, your car's my car. We all shared. That right there, friend, the surface stuff, man, that got them deep in a heartbeat. God saw that and went, whoa, my, my. No man's lacking anything in this place. I think I'll just pour out my spirit again. You notice in the early church, he just sort of came down. Wasn't it one time where Peter was sort of preaching and the power just came down? You know, that's powerful, Acts 10. You know, right in the middle of his message, wham, the power fell. Fill with the Holy Ghost. They were deep, friend. How about it? Are you? Here's what we're going to do. I want everyone to leave out of this place deeper in God than you came in. That's all I'm going to say. And everyone in this place, you need to confirm that in your heart right now. Make a mini resolution right now that you're going to go out of this place deeper in God than you came in. That means... If you're here and you're backslidden, you're doing things that Jesus would never do, you're going to come down to this altar. Those of you listening through the earphones and you're being, we have nations, that, there's a room in the back where we have interpreter after interpreter after interpreter. We interpret nations, sometimes 15 different languages are interpreted. But every one of you that are listening through headsets, I understand, I know that the interpreters know what I'm saying. They interpret very well here. If there is sin in your life, that means you're doing something that Jesus wouldn't do. When this altar call is given, you drop those headsets and you come down. Your interpreter is going to let you go. I mean, you just, they're in a back room. You just come down here and get right with God. Get deep real quick and get the sin out of your life. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. Those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, I would encourage you to go deep in God right now. No, you're not joining a church. You're not joining a Sunday school. You're not joining a choir. You're joining Jesus. And it's deep. It's powerful. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the one that created it all. I joined up with him 22 years ago and have never left him. 
never will. You can't get deeper than Jesus. That's the deepest you can get. No one out there is any deeper. The devil knows it. If you don't believe that, say Jesus to a demon-possessed person. Try it, friend. The devil knows his name and trembles because Jesus is deep. The devil is not deep like that, friend. Jesus is deep. He's gone all the way there. He's fought the fight. He's paid the price. So if you've never known the Lord tonight, you can come meet him. And those of you in this place that are religious, dear God, it's time to get past the chandeliers. Get past the choir robe. You can go to hell with the choir robe on. Get past the communion cup and the wafer. Get past the certificate of ordination hanging behind your desk. That ain't deep, trust me. That is not deep. You can go to hell as an ordained minister. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go to hell with baptismal waters dripping off your face. I'm telling you right now, friend, if you're religious in this place, and all those things are important, but none of them will save you. I know some of you are getting irritated right now because this stuff right here, it just messes with America, and it really messes with Europe big time. But it messes with America because Europe's so religious it stinks. I love Europe. We go there. We minister. We plant churches. But Europe, there's a church everywhere. I mean, they're just but the cathedrals, massive cathedrals, but death everywhere, just drugs, alcoholism, pornography, nude beaches, junk everywhere. Boy, a lot of those people, you'll see them in church on Sunday. But America's just as bad. Religious, but we don't know God. You go to church on Sunday morning, but you go to church to maybe get a little touch from God. See, you're supposed to take Jesus to church. You're not supposed to go to church to find Jesus. Just the sinner does that. But as a, as a person that calls himself a quote-unquote Christian, you're supposed to go to church to fellowship with believers. Could you imagine, Pastor, if everyone who came to church with Jesus, what kind of service you'd have? You wouldn't have to worry about who you're offending or anything like that because they're all there with Jesus. They love God. You know, they're going after God, and then if sinners come in, they're going to they're they're gonna, they're gonna be caught in the net because everybody loves Jesus, you know, and, and they're going to be loving on the sinners, and man, what a church. But sadly, it's not like that because it's full of religious people. And they're not satisfied until you sung all four verses of Amazing Grace. Or they're not satisfied until you've given a three-point sermon in 35 minutes and no more. It's all religion, friend. Religion will damn your soul. Let me ask you this, friend. Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Are you consumed with him? Are you thinking about him all day long? If not, I question your salvation. Bible school students, I question your salvation if you're not consumed with Jesus. I'm talking about consumed with him. You're breathing him all day long. You're a bride about to get married. You're about to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what a Christian is. And if you're not, if you're not infatuated with him, something's wrong. If you're not thinking about him all day, if you're lukewarm or you're cold, friend, you're hell bound. There's only one temperature, and that's hot. Going after God. So I'm asking you that question. Do you find yourself infatuated with him, or are you just sort of lukewarm, cold? You need to hit these altars as soon as charity begins to sing. And here's how, this is how it's going to work tonight. She's going to sing mercy seat. Mercy is a deep, mercy is a deep word. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. God's going to show mercy. Jesus shed his blood on Calvary for you, friend. This song is deep. What you're about to do is deep. Everyone who has sin in their life, something between you and God, you're going to come down to these altars. If you want an anointing in your life, you want us to pray for you that God will pour out his spirit and use you mightily, and you, you're going to hold on to a sin in your life? You got a porno magazine out in your automobile, or you got a few X-rated movies at home, or you just, you just love your off day. Boy, when Saturday comes around, you just love to just kick back and watch some junk on television. But you want an anointing too. Don't you ask me to put my hands on you, friend. Don't you ask me to lay my hands on you. 
That's dangerous waters right there. They're like Ananias and Sapphira, playing games with God, man. No, 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 no. Get the sin out. Get the sin out. Pour your heart out before God. Lay down at this altar and say, Jesus, I pour it all out before you. I don't want any more of this in my life. And then we'll pray with you, friend. But tonight when Charity sings Mercy Seat, you're going to come quickly from the balcony. Those of you at home, you're going to get on your face before God right there in your living room. Those of you in your cars, you're going to repent. And I, I want to encourage you to pull over in a, a parking lot or on the interstate. Pull over to the emergency lane. It's an emergency. Just pull over. And you're going to pray right there. You're going to ask the Lord to forgive you and wash you and cleanse you, make you new. But if you hesitate tonight, you know you're supposed to be down here. Hesitation, friend, that's a surface lure. He'll wiggle it right there, friend. He'll see you see it, and he'll say, hey, 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 come on now. You can do this at home. You don't need to go down there and repent. You don't need to go down there and repent. Why do you think the devil's saying that? Because he knows if you come down there, friend, you're going to get deep. Heaven's going to come down. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. The devil knows if you go home, you'll sit there, and part of what's going to happen when you go home is condemnation because you wish you, you didn't have the guts to come down here. But another thing that's going to happen is God's going to speak to you about his son, Jesus, who not only was beaten, not only was spat upon, not only was cursed, a crown pressed on his forehead, blood dripping into his eyes, stinging his eyes, a whip 39 times raking across his back from the top of his, from the back of his neck to his buttocks, plowing his back, ripping it to shreds with bones and glass tied to those throngs of leather, pulling that across his back. That wasn't enough. Dragging a cross all the way up to Calvary. That wasn't enough. Then they stripped him. And most theologians, whether you believe it or not, most theologians believe because of Roman crucifixion back then that the people crucified were naked. They stripped our Jesus. I believe that. I believe they took his clothes off laid him on the cross. That's to cover every humiliating thing that will ever happen to you in your life. You'll never suffer anything more than Jesus suffered. And hanging on a, na naked on a cross in front of all those people, in front of your disciples, in front of the women that you led, to, you led into the kingdom, looking up at you, naked, pierced, his hands, his feet, all that in front of the multitude, not behind Mount Calvary, but on top of it. And he looks out at everyone at Brownsville. He sees us all. And the, the Lord's going to remind you tonight, my son did all that for you publicly, and you can't walk 25 feet. It's pride, friend, and it'll damn your soul. What you need to do is shake that off of you, shake that pride. Pride is like a cork that keeps you on top of the water. What you need to do is shake that off, cut it, cut the line, and dive down to these altars and get right with God. Right now, Charity is going to sing Mercy Seat. Everyone who's away from God, everyone who's never known the Lord, everyone who needs forgiveness, I want you to come right now. Hurry in the balcony right now. Hurry. Come on, right now. I need Jesus. I need forgiveness. Wash me. Cleanse me. Come on. Come on. Come on. Join the hundreds that are coming down here. Come on. Come on. I face the power of sin on my own. Hurry. I did not know Come on. the place I could go where I could find a way to heal my wounds. Hurry. Soul. Hurry. Hurry. Get deep in God. Go down. Die. He said that I could come Die into tonight. his presence Go deeper in God. Without I need I'm Jesus. Running. I need Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. He's calling. He said his grace will cover me. His blood will for no free name. How about it, friend? What have you been thinking about? Are you living on the surface? Are you living up there, friend, where everything's wonderful, everything's nice? I'm telling you right now, go below the surface. Go where Jesus lives. Go deep. Go below the surface right now. Repent of your sin. Quit falling for the devil's lures. Go down. Dive. Dive. Get down and say, 
Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, forgive me, make me new. Do it, friend. He'll do it for you. The depth of God's love will meet the depth of your sin. Wherever you're at, he'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. Come on. Hurry. 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 Come on now, we'll wait on you. We'll wait on you. It's early. Come on. Come on. God bless you, ma'am. Come on. I know a place. Come on, guys. Come on, guys.